In 1073 AD, Kong Chu Gyapo, a member of the illustrious Kun family, founded a monastery in Sakya, Tibet, and the name and lineage of the Sakya school of Tibetan Buddhism was thereby established. Buddha Shakyamuni had predicted in Manjushri Tantra that the Sagya monastery would make the Dharma blossom magnificently in Tibet. Accordingly, in the 12th and 13th centuries, thanks to the great efforts made by Sajya Gunga Ningbo, Tsonan Temo, Zaba Gyatsen, uh, Choji Sagya Pandita, and the Chogya Fapa, in promoting the teachings of both Sutra and Tantra, the Sagya order played a prominent role in the religious culture and life of Tibet. And the five great founders of the Sagyapa lineage have since been known as the five patriarchs of the Sagya tradition. His Holiness Sagya Trism was also born into the ancient and distinguished family of Kun. As the 41st Supreme Head of the Sagya School, His Holiness has received a perfect and well-rounded education in Buddhist philosophy, beginning from his childhood, which includes numerous common and uncommon teachings from many great gurus who bestowed on him empowerments, initiations, blessings, oral transmissions, explanations, and pith instructions. Over the years, he has attained supreme accomplishments in practicing the precious and profound Dharma, and through his consummate skill, in imparting these teachings, he has also become a great guru and a supreme guide for tens of thousands of disciples and devotees all over the world. By 2002, both in India and abroad, as a result of his generosity and compassion, His Holiness has given the precious common and uncommon Landre teachings 14 times, the collection of sadhanas three times, and the collection of tantras for eight years in a row. We've got only one chant earlier. It's founded and also uh, established and uh, flourished by the Kuen lineage. And the Kuen lineage were believed to be the direct descendants of the celestial beings which then continued. So I was also born in this uh, family. And so from, from the very, uh, since birth, of course, I've been trained in the uh, Buddhist teachings in general, and particularly uh, in the Sakya teachings, uh, because all the current lineage members are uh, to become lamas and some of them become monks and um, but um, like myself I'm not monk but I'm the lineage uh, uh, holder and since then I have received many intensive uh, uh, sutrayana as well as mantrayana and innumerable uh, empowerments and teachings in Tibet as well as uh, in India and I still uh, continue to receive teachings, even in this day. His Holiness Sagya Trizen stands for Supreme Wisdom. He is an emanation of the Bodhisattva Manjushri. His Holiness founded the Sagya Center in India in 1980, which has become the main monastery of the Sagya lineage. In the afternoon, sound of the Dharma drums floated out of the Sagya Center. All the Lamas were moving toward the main shrine. A solemn Dharma ceremony was about to begin. The solemnity of the puja was beyond our expectations. As we listen to the rhythmic rumble of Dharma drums, the loud and resounding music of conches and the Chinese oboe, which rose between sessions of sutra chanting, we could not but feel the great power of Dharma and the blessings of the Buddha.
our minds gradually at peace, our souls purified. His Holiness Throne was located at the center of the main shrine, with the gigantic statue of Buddha Shakyamuni towering at his back. All the Dharma practitioners, including lamas, reincarnated tukus, and numerous Tibetan laymen, believe that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is an emanation of Avalokiteshvara, whereas His Holiness Sakya Trizen is genuinely an emanation of Mansu Sri. Both emanations, whether coming into being through the institution of reincarnation or through blood heredity, stand for unsurpassed glory and wisdom. The concept of Buddhahood in Tibetan Buddhism differs greatly from other religious definitions for God or gods. Buddhism believes that every human being has Buddha nature, which means that every human being can become a Buddha. Besides, only by achieving Buddhahood and attaining our primordial wisdom can we rise above the misery of cyclic existence and bring liberation to other sentient beings as well. Receiving empowerments is the gateway to Tantric Buddhism. It is in fact the first important step in actual Dharma practice. Without empowerment, one cannot practice any teachings and the Guru is the root of all realizations. Only through empowerments bestowed by a guru with authentic realizations can we have the seeds of Buddhahood planted in our mental continuum. During the empowerment puja, Lucia, a young woman from Russia, learned to perform some mudra with the guru, which means that from now on she was formally empowered to become a dharma practitioner. She shed tears during the chanting of scriptures, probably moved by the compassion of her guru. We were also moved by the scene, knowing that one more person has engendered the bodhicitta, the mind for enlightenment, and that one more person has vowed to diligently practice dharma for the sake of all sentient beings. Starting from 10 o'clock each morning, His Holiness begins to receive visitors. In addition to local Tibetans and Indians, his visitors include people coming from Tibet, Nepal, and other countries. Tibetans hold His Holiness in the highest esteem. Each year, many Tibetan laymen, as well as lamas of the Sakya order, left Tibet in secret and climbed over mountains against all odds for the sole purpose of paying respects and offering kata to His Holiness. For them, to be able to see His Holiness once is the dream of a lifetime come true. Seated there on the throne is not just a sacred Dharma king, but also a wise and compassionate elder to whom Tibetans brought the problems of their daily life for advice. Whether it is about health, career, or a wedding, a funeral, or even about visa applications for their children, it would be great to obtain some guidance from His Holiness. Watching the way His Holiness interacted with the Tibetan people, one suddenly recalled a key passage from a Chinese classic. The way of the great learning lies in befriending the people in aiming at the supreme good. Chiawang Rinpoche is a compassionate elder of His Holiness lineage. He went into retreat in 1981 and has remained in retreat ever since for 23 years now, maintaining his meditation four sessions per day. <laughs> Mother, the Tabas and Tang Madimaras. No, 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 no
七年那个没烟，土地去抽嘛的是，年底呢说是嘛没碰抽个嘛的是，年底呢嘛听着嘛的，但天气的嘛差上几年嘛，没烟用的嘛土地，人家嘛烟土地用的土地。Traditionally, when one is in retreat, one should confine oneself strictly within a retreat room sealed by a ritual circle of protection in complete seclusion, so that one may focus his mind in deep meditative absorption. But out of his compassion for the suffering sentient beings, Che Wang Rinpoche chose to conduct his retreat in a more flexible manner. When talking about His Holiness Sakya Trizen, Although we did not understand his language, we could feel through his benign and bright eyes how deeply he loves and respects his holiness. <laughs> ซึ่งเดลัยพอดีสิ่งที่ชิมาลายอันที่นั่นมาเนี่ยจ้ะแต่ผมดูมันดูสิ่งที่เราสมัยนี้แต่เนี่ยยิ่งมาเกิดเป
The young teacher, Tashi Puntok, spoke with us about the situation. I mean, there are different countries, the students that come from all over, the, all over India, and they are from different countries. Some of them are Ladakh, some of them are from Mustang, and even from Tibet. And, uh, and also, they are come from local Indian kids are coming from here to study. And uh, they are different, they, are, uh, they, are, they have got a different age, they have got very different age level. And mainly it's very difficult to teach them, you know, because how it's difficult means it is difficult because of uh, they don't understand our language, or most Tibetan language, they don't understand. And some of them are from Nepal, and I used to speak them on Tibetan and Nepali. The local Nepal from their local language is Nepal. So I have to speak on them to, to make them understand. I have to speak Nepali or Tibetan. The class was dismissed. The little lamas formed a line and repeatedly tried to pronounce the words they had just learned. The teacher patiently listened to each boy, correcting their pronunciation. Some of the students Tashi Pultok had taught here have already left the Sakya Center and begun their studies in the Sakya College. However, up to the present, scarcity of resources has persisted as a problem. All the 113 little lamas were squeezed into the same bedroom. The teacher who accompanied them all the time observed jokingly, if one boy catches cold, all the others sneeze with him. Only a little while ago, there was a serious case of infection of keratitis in these quarters. Almost one half of these little boys continued to attend the class red-eyed for a whole month. The tennis ball, normally played between two people, became a football here, played by all. They followed the same rules as the World Cup, replete with umpires as well as penalty kicks. Judging by the seriousness with which they played the ball, you felt that it was more than just a game. Whether it was a football or a simple throwing of pebbles, a game is always associated with competition. However, under the circumstances of serious scarcity of resources, their game had nothing to do with winning or losing. Since they were all in the same financial straits, nobody had anything to lose. On the other hand, all could win sincere friendships. Between July and September is the monsoon season in India. Heavy downpours always took you by surprise. The lamas found shelter in front of the gates of the main shrine. Coming from different countries and regions, they shared the same background of living at the mercy of winds and rains. Looking at the big downpour, which caught them unawares, they knew that the Sakya Center is their only refuge from the fury of the elements and that the Buddha and His Holiness would remain their spiritual guides throughout their lives. In 1959, soon after his enthronement ceremony, His Holiness left Tibet and stayed in India in exile. In the years that followed, many Tibetans of the Sakya order had arrived at this strange country to gather together around His Holiness. The government of India showed great hospitality to these innocent Tibetan refugees, providing the Sakya population with a settlement in Purwara. There seem to be some optimistic and cheerful genes running in the blood veins of the Tibetan people. A national character forged by many centuries of nomadic lifestyle and folkways has definitely exerted some positive influence on their new life in exile. One must live and live well, at peace with oneself and with the surroundings, whether one finds oneself residing tranquilly on the plateaus of the land of snows or eking out a precarious livelihood after months and years of roaming in the new settlement of Purwara. With a blue sky and white walls, colorful Dharma flags and pennants flying in the wind, Tibetans have settled down on this tract of land, forming a number of neighborhoods, with quiet houses looking contentedly at each other. Except for the fact that the air wasn't so thin, it was as if they had returned to their homeland in Tibet. 
For a community which was unaccustomed to strangers, our visit appeared to be an unusual event. However, the feeling of strangeness lasted for only a moment. At the outset, these Tibetans would look at you warily, but a one-word greeting, Chashtele, was all it took to melt tension and mistrust. The Tibetans have a unique, compassionate smile with dense and deep wrinkles all over their faces when smiling. And it seems that those smiles of simplicity and contentment are also the best gifts the Buddha has bestowed upon these Tibetans. Not far from this community is the school for the children of these Tibetan people. There were five grades, one class for each grade. The class with the greatest number of people was the third grade, which consisted of 16 students. The kids were singing songs to welcome their visitors. Clear voices of singing floated from the five classrooms, reverberating in the open air as if in competition. Students from the first grade sang two songs, one in Tibetan, another in English. Even if we could not make out the meaning of the verses, the very rhythm and the tune of the songs touched our hearts with their fervor and sincerity. Their voice was so clean, not polluted by any tangle or sophistication. In addition to general courses of instruction, the school also taught them basic religious values. Faith has taken roots in their mind ever since childhood and will certainly provide them with the staunchest support and impetus in the years ahead. Lunchtime, the main dish for today was rice soaked in mung bean soup. It would be the same tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. In Taiwan, you might worry if this meager diet was nutritious enough for kids who are growing up rapidly. But here, their basic concern was whether they would have enough to keep them fed and warm every day. Like the lamas in the monasteries, before each meal, in token of their gratitude to the Buddha, each of them raised the plate of food over his or her head to make an offering. Listening to the prayer chanted in those innocent children's voices, you felt deeply how sincere they were in being grateful for each and every resource which they obtained the hard way. Across the school is a carpet manufacturing center founded by the Tibetan settlement. It is also a showcase of how the Tibetan women have successfully helped their families make a decent living. Not far away is the residential area so here, they can make arrangements to work and take care of their kids at home at the same time. Handmade carpets are priced by inch, each stitch of the needlework demonstrating genuine substance and craftsmanship. An experienced carpet maker can earn a monthly wage of approximately 20 US dollars. A carpet the size of a cushion is worth less than 30 US dollars, yet it would take more than 10 working days to finish making it. However meager the income seems, it does provide a stable livelihood much better than that of the years in exile. As a senior member of the Tibetan community put it, here with our family, with His Holiness and the Buddha, we don't lack anything it else. It's important uh, for us to, to preserve the culture and uh, Sakya tradition. For that purpose, we have started the Psyche Center, Psyche College, Psyche Institute in Puruwala. And also we have many, and Namari, and also we have many branch monasteries all over India. And uh, then also uh, we have the settlement for lay people. So in this way, that we, by staying all of them together to preserve the unique culture and the religious traditions of, of the Sakya order. Each day at the same hour, the elderly residents began to move toward the community's stupa of Dharma wheels. Walking along the walls, they pushed rows of Dharma wheels. Each round of the turning of the Dharma wheel represents chanting the scriptures once. The men more advanced in age would turn the bigger dharma wheels, which gave off loud sounds. It was such a moving scene, a large group of people focusing their minds on only one task. Everybody was so sincere, so dedicated, so pious. 
There was not a single Buddha statue present, not a single Lama, yet nobody could fail to sense the splendor and solemnity of Dharma. Maybe it was exactly because the Buddha was so compassionate, he let people come up with the ingenious method of turning the Dharma wheels. So they began to push the Dharma wheels, each new round representing the chanting of the scriptures one more time. Thereby, these senior devotees obtained satisfaction and peace of mind all the same for having practiced Dharma. When we were leaving the Tibetan community, the senior residents saw us off at the gates of the village. We took this group picture and we said goodbye to them with great reluctance. The Sakya Hospital was established in 2001, the only medical institution in town, and for a hundred square miles all round. Though a very small hospital, it has internal, surgical, dental departments, a pharmacy, and some sick rooms. For the citizens of Dehradun, whose financial situation was extremely bad, this is the only place where their ailments, big or small, get some treatment. Before the arrival of His Holiness, Patients could only make use of primitive methods for cure, or they just helplessly suffered. Like many other charity hospitals, the Sakya Hospital is dedicated to the relief of people's suffering, taking only minimal fees. Financially, its expenses mostly depend on funds from the Sakya Center. We have uh, now, Sakya Center is looking after Sakya Nunnery, Sakya Institute in Purwala where you visited yesterday and all their food, accommodation, medical expenditures, everything is uh, taken care of by Sakya Center. So, so we have lots of monks and nuns who came from Tibet and who are not used to the weather and climate here and we have to send them to the uh, local hospitals in the town and they are very expensive. So uh, then we thought that we should have the hospital because not only for our monks and nuns, and we can see a lot of poor Indians, local peoples who cannot afford uh, to go to the town. And uh, this is our idea that uh, monasteries now should start to do some social works, not just uh, engaging with the pujas and these things. And uh, I very much admire those uh, who are doing the social works. And we have a lot of difficulties in this world. We have a lot of problems. And many of the problems can be solved in one way or another. But the most difficult time is when one is sick. So, so therefore, that if you can do something who are sick, and it is very great help, because that is the time that whether he, is, he or she is going to continue as a human or going to finish. So we, uh, we think that uh, it is the biggest problem and it is very important uh, work to have a hospital. And in this town there are quite a number of small, small hospitals, but they are not big hospitals. The director of the hospital was also a Sakyapa Lama, a Dharma practitioner, one who looked wise and talked sense. In our conversation, he was always concise and to the point, mentioning many practical issues the hospital confronted. In order to help more people, he had to take time out of his meditation to deal with the hospital's daily mundane matters. The Buddha helps people to face their spiritual pain with composure, but the hospital has to use more down-to-earth approaches to cope with the impermanence of the body. The motivation of this is uh, uh, gen generally in this area there are many poor people and then also a lot of monks and nuns and so to, to give them proper treatment especially for the poor Indians who cannot afford to pay their uh, treatments so for the purpose, for the sake of this that we try to build uh, this temple and uh, this uh, hospital 
and uh, where we give both uh, allopathic medicine as well as traditional Tibetan uh, medicine. And we do not have a regular uh, kind of funding for so that they, they uh, encounter some difficulties uh, regarding the, the financial um, uh, things. Various kinds of medicine were lined up neatly on the walls of the pharmacy. But it was obvious that the exterior packages looked old and damaged. For the more advanced and civilized world, those bottles and boxes of medicine were probably soon to be dumped, or even already outdated. But for the local Tibetans and Indians, each box represented an opportunity for getting well. His Holiness says that the hospital is the most direct means of alleviating sentient beings' pain. In the crowded hall, patients walked to and fro. Outside the waiting room, more patients stood in lines, Indians as well as Tibetans. Love knows of no natural boundaries, so does religion. Guided by the Buddha's compassion, in this hospital, the Sake order gives relief to sentient beings impartially, just as the light of Dharma shines limitlessly. The existing Sakya College is the first educational building of the Sakya Center. It can accommodate some 200 young lamas who come from different places, including the little lamas brought up in the Sakya Center. Once they have reached a certain age and level of learning, they are in a position to come here for further studies in Buddhism. Courses in the curriculum include instructions in sutras and tantras, as well as Buddhist philosophy. Instructors are all professors who have not only profound and extensive knowledge of Buddhism, but have also achieved realizations out of arduous Dharma practice. After the professor has finished his lectures, it is up to each individual to find out how much he can understand, each in accordance with his talent. The scriptural debate between classmates is indeed the most efficient pedagogical method. In each round of the debates, and during the dialectical process, issues are clarified, the mind is sharpened, so that the student's understanding is deepened. As the Sangha population steadily increased, it became obvious that the original Sagya Center and the Sagya College in its present form could no longer accommodate growing needs. Consequently, His Eminence Gyana Vajra Rinpoche made a proposal to build a new Sagya College. The main goal for building the Sakya Academy is to give the children a uh, monastery education and at, at the same time uh, modern education like uh, math, science, history, geography. So these are all important uh, subjects which uh, uh, any, any children, every children should learn. For, uh, so uh, at the same time we're giving monastery educations so they could be uh, uh, go they could use that in, the, in their own lives. The piece of land needed for this project was already purchased four years ago. With an area of 15 acres, it is seven miles away from the Sakya Center, far from the noise of the city, replete with wildflowers, meadows, and rolling hills. With blue skies and white clouds above, and herds of grazing cattle below, it would look very much like the natural scenery you of Tibet. see the religious teachings, Buddhist teachings that the in general and particularly uh, in the Sakya order. There are many esoteric and extraterrestrial teachings, empowerments and the commentaries. And there are also uh, meditational uh, instructions and also to do the meditation for a very long period of time. In addition to such basic courses as Buddhism and philosophy, the Sakya College also plans to include modern sciences and arts in its curriculum. 
The Buddhist courses are designed to cultivate compassion and the mind of enlightenment, whereas the courses of modern education will help the students connect with the rest of the world. It is our sincere hope that in the future there will be sufficient space for educating the younger generations. We hope that numerous lamas will come here to practice Dharma and to receive a well-rounded Buddhist education. It is our earnest hope that upon the completion of their education here, they will capably shoulder the sacred duty of preserving and propagating the Sakya legacy in particular and the Buddha's teachings in general. Once having made his commitment to this worthy cause, His Holiness has decided to mobilize all the Sakya-related individuals and institutions around the world to raise funds for the construction of the Sakya College. The Sakya College represents the lifelong goals of both His Holiness and all the Sakya Sangha members. We fervently hope that this project will be completed as soon as possible. Though no one knows for sure when this hope will come to fruition, yet we do know that this noble legacy of shouldering the responsibility will always flow in the blood veins of His Holiness' noble clan generation after generation after generation, endlessly. The for our main wish is to preserve the Buddhist teaching in general, and particularly the Sakya order, and for that in the future generation, for many generations to come, to preserve this. So therefore, my younger son, he has taken the, uh, undertaking this project of Sakya Academy, where the young monks will have the traditional training as well as uh, the modern education. So that the, with the two together, they, they will be able to carry on the, the traditional values as well as uh, they can live in the, and cooperate with the, uh, the modern uh, life. Finally, as His Holiness was chanting a mantra, we pray that whoever has the good karma to watch and listen to this program will receive his blessings and gain ultimate wisdom. May the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas bless you all.